Mr. President, we are very honored to have you here today uh, to discuss the current situation in the EU and tell us if you think the EU has any chance of reevaluating itself, check its course and maybe listen a little bit to the European populations. The floor is yours, Mr. President. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the organization of this important gathering and um, for giving me the chance of speaking here. Thank you for the nice, Lars, thank you for the nice words. I am motivated to be here because I'm convinced that we are approaching one of the crucial moments of European history. I suppose most of you came for the same reason. We know that not Europe, but the European Union is a problem to worry about. Being aware of it, we try to open the eyes of our fellow Europeans who seem to be hopelessly lost in the noise of the EU propaganda and who are more and more indoctrinated by it. The misuse of words and the evident lies we experience in today's European debates bring us close to the world of George Orwell and of our communist past. The title of my today's remarks, as it was introduced in the program, uh, is identical with the title of my recent book. When I say the title, in Czech, the title was European Integration Without Illusions, but the British publisher decided to call it uh, Europe Shattering, the Shattering of Illusions, which is a misstatement because I have never had any illusions <laughs> about, the, about the EU, so, so it is not necessary to shatter them, at least in my case. The book was, uh, the German publisher called it Europe needs, uh, Europa braucht Freiheit, Europe needs freedom, which is also, also possible. The book was published a year and a half ago in Prague in the Czech language and has its English, German, Spanish, Italian, Bulgarian and Danish versions and the Russian and Polish editions are under preparation. Um, speaking about illusions, as I said, uh, I don't have any as regards the EU. What I feel, however, is a long-term frustration with the whole European situation, not just with the Eurozone, Eurozone crisis. I don't like cheaply devaluing words, but in this case the term frustration seems appropriate. We, in our part of Europe, use this term quite often in the long-lasting and highly depressive and demotivating communist era. When I use it now, some people do not understand me or do not believe me. They take it as an overstatement, which it is not. Our communist experience sharpened our eyes and radicalized our political stances, something, something which is missing in Western Europe, as I understand it. Nazism is already forgotten and is more and more considered a mere aberration, impossible to be replicated. Communism was not a personal experience here. The aim of the book was to demonstrate my fundamental disagreement with the European integration model, which has, has been built on the naive and excessively optimistic expectations concerning the economic benefits of territorial integration, unification and centralization of the whole continent, 
without paying attention to its costs and on the inexcusable negligence and underestimation of the undemocratic consequences arising from the long-term undermining, if not liquidation, of nation-states in Europe and from the far-going transfer of decision-making to Brussels. This is the short but I hope correct summary of my position. All the available evidence suggests that the future will not be easy for those of us who live in Europe, who live here together with our families, children and grandchildren, who have genuine, not only academic interest in its future developments, who are not willing to passively accept the massive destruction of European values, habits, lifestyles and institutions which made Europe in the past such a unique place to live in. I am, and I am not alone, not ready to live in this version of the brave new world. My country, the Czech Republic, is a part of Europe, a member of the European Union, and a non-member of the Eurozone. In this respect, it's identical with Great Britain. There are, however, important differences. We are not a monarchy. We are not an island protected by the Channel. We are still handicapped by our communist past. What is even more relevant is that more than 80% of our exports go to Europe, to a region which undergoes a long-lasting economic stagnation and an acute sovereign debt crisis. Even with the freely floating Czech crown, we are not able to disconnect ourselves from the rest of Europe. The Czech Republic, as a textbook case of a small open economy, needs a healthy economic growth of its main trading partners to be able to grow. And this is regretfully not the case now. The current economic and political problems in Europe didn't come out of the blue. They were also not imported from somewhere. They are the direct consequence both of the European economic and social system and of the EU institutional arrangements. They both these two factors form an insurmountable obstacle to any positive development and obstacle which can be removed neither by more optimistic rhetoric by Mr. Barroso nor by eventually more rational short-term economic policies. The problems go much deeper they are rooted in the post-Second World War developments, ideas and ideologies, in the now dominant European mindset, which some of us call Europeism. It is an incoherent amalgam of the whole cluster of both old and new, profoundly anti-liberal isms. What is fundamentally flawed is, in my understanding, the European economic and social system, which is not a system of free markets. Ours is the world of heavily distorted markets. It is quite logical that the overregulated European economy, additionally constrained by a heavy load of social and environmental requirements, operating in a paternalistic 
welfare state atmosphere makes healthy economic growth impossible. This burden is too heavy and the incentives to a productive work too weak. If Europe wants to grow, it has to transform itself. It has to undergo a systemic change, something we, in our part of, the, of Europe, made 20 years ago. It was easier to do it there because our communist past gave us many very instructive and unforgettable lessons which the current generation of West Europeans did not get. We wanted to establish market economy without adjectives, which was one of my widely quoted slogans at that time. But by joining the EU, we got as an entry welcome present something fundamentally different, the soziale Marktwirtschaft. I am not sure it is possible to change it again or soon. I don't see any political party in Europe now ready to start radically depoliticizing, deregulating, desubsidizing the economy. It must be done, however. That's not all. Additional problems have been irreparably brought about by the European integration model, the artificial, absolutely unnecessary centralization, bureaucratization, harmonization, standardization, unification, and therefore de-democratization of the European continent based on the concept of an ever closer union is another fatal mistake. The European Union has conquered Europe and deprived it of its <coughs> democracy. The issue of democracy or better to say of the lack of it is for me the most important and the most pressing one. How is it possible that the issue is not sufficiently discussed in Europe these days? Is democracy considered not so important? The Europeans are partly understandably occupied by debating the failure of the euro, which is, of course, a sufficiently big problem. They pay the costs, but don't want to hear that this failure was inevitable and that its consequences were well known in advance. All economists who deserve to be called economists had known that Greece and some other countries were doomed to fail having been imprisoned in such economically irrational scheme which was introduced mostly on the basis of political not economic arguments. And these political <coughs> arguments did not come spontaneously from individual <coughs> member countries and certainly not from citizens of these countries who had lost the belief in their own old currencies. This evidently economically inefficient and politically anti-democratic project was promoted by European politicians and intellectuals who traditionally do not pay attention to economic efficiency and democracy. They are satisfied with their own wealth and with their own power. 
the benefits promised as a result of accepting a common currency never arrived, which may not be necessary to stress here in England. The proclaimed, proclaimed increase in international trade and financial transactions was relatively small and temporary and was more than offset by the huge and ever-growing costs of this arrangement. It is evident that in good weather, in economic sense, even the non-optimal currency areas could function as all kinds of fixed exchange rates regimes did for some time. When bad weather came, the financial and economic crisis at the end of the last decade, all the inconsistencies, imbalances, weaknesses, inefficiencies, discrepancies and disequilibria became evident and the monetary union ceased to function. This was not a surprise. In the past, all fixed exchange rate regimes needed exchange rates realignments sooner or later, which is another argument found in any elementary economic textbook. The expectations or better to say wishes or dreams to make the very heterogeneous European economy homogeneous by means of monetary unification prove to be wrong. The European economies have diverged, not converged, since the introduction of the euro. Monetary union requires for its meaningful operation several preconditions that are not so easy to fulfill. Some of them were formulated in the 1961 Robert Mandel's seminal article. But uh, Professor Mandel forgot to tell us that when there are significant transfer payments, very high degree of income redistribution inside individual member countries of the monetary union, there must be symmetrically huge fiscal <coughs> transfers among member countries of the monetary union as well. The redistributionist and entitlement mentality which is dominant in Europe can't be suppressed at the union level. This point has <coughs> been, to my mind, never sufficiently discussed and recognized in the past. It has been suddenly discovered in connection with the Eurozone debt crisis. I, I was the last Minister of Finance of the dissolving monetary union called Czechoslovakia and I know something about the necessity of sending fiscal transfers for one part of the country to another just to prolong the existence of the monetary union and not only monetary union, also political union of Czechoslovakia. So we have some theoretical knowledge about it but we have some practical experience with the same issue also. I stress the systemic issues, the issues of the, of the system and consider it wrong when some people <coughs> forget the broader context and concentrate on the short term behavior or misbehavior of individual countries, e.g. of Greece or of any <coughs> other country countries of the European South. Greece 
I would like to stress, Greece did not cause the current European problems. Greece, on the contrary, was the victim of the Eurozone scheme. The system is a problem, not Greece. Greece made just one fatal error to enter the Eurozone. Everything else was its usual behavior. Letting Greece leave the Eurozone would be the beginning of a long journey of this country to a healthy economic future. Some Greeks, regretfully not their politicians, already understood that one size does not fit all. And I only wish the same would be understood by leading EU politicians. I don't see it, however. I like very much like Christensen, but I was shocked this morning to hear that he expects that the German election will change it by a miracle. I can't imagine anything like that. But I wish you were right. It would be nice. That's another, that's another story. Um, time is right. In my understanding of the situation, the time is right for a fundamental decision. Should we continue believing in the dogma that politics can dictate economics? It was an old communist slogan we experienced for half a century in our country. Uh, so should we continue believing in the dogma that politics can dictate economics? Or should we accept that we have to return to democracy and to an elementary economic rationality? My answer is yes. We have to make a change. We have to initiate a radical discontinuity with the past. The sooner, the better. The past would be immediately after the German elections. Uh, the European elections next year represent one of the chances to say it out loud. Not only in Great Britain or in the Czech Republic, but all over Europe. What we need is not a new round of summits in Brussels but the courage of citizens of individual European countries to say that the emperor has no clothes, that the current EU arrangement is a mistake, conceptually mistake. It must be done not in Brussels. It must be done in a genuine political process it must arise as an outcome of political debates in a democratic setting. It must be generated by the people, by the demos of these countries, not by inhabitants of Europe or by bureaucrats in Brussels. We already live in a semi-democracy or post-democracy, but we still have elections. It is our duty to make use of them. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my short message. Thank you very much for your attention.